Day. Um, Franco Key is a fund manager. We invest in commercial litigations. Uh, we, don't, we haven't done much in the uh, enforcement side, but you know, there are a couple of panelists here who's done a lot of enforcement actions. Uh, Luis, you want to start by introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Louise Trahan, director from Benchwalk Advisors. Benchwalk Advisors was founded in October 2017. We have nearly a billion to invest in litigation funding and legal financing, and I'm looking forward to some challenging questions from everyone on what really goes on inside litigation funding. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher DeLise. I'm the founder and CEO of Delta Capital. Uh, Delta is a litigation funder that's been in business since 2011. Uh, we focus on uh, international arbitration claims, portfolio facilities, enforcement actions, and uh, inter uh, finance and investment claims uh, on a global basis. Um, hi, everybody. My name's uh, Jim Little, uh, and I'm the, uh, I guess, founder, and what's my title? Founder and managing director of Drumcliff. Uh, we have been investing in asset recovery and judgment enforcement claims for about 10 years now. Um, have about 100 million in AUM. And uh, we, yeah, we look at things all over the world. So I guess we're, in that respect, we're, we're kind of like everybody else here, chasing assets around the world. Maybe before we start, can I see a show of hands for those of you who's looked at litigation finance uh, at all? That's pretty good. So. Super keen audience. Yes, sure. So, Luis, maybe I begin with you. Uh, over the past two years, uh, depending on which uh, statistics you, you hear about, about $2 billion was raised uh, in the last 18 months. Do you see any uh, pricing pressure uh, from a deal flow perspective? Sure, yes. Um, it's difficult to know exactly the size of the market because there are plenty of hedge funds who are dabbling in this space and don't really shout about it. I've seen publications saying two to three billion in the UK. The main jurisdictional focus is probably Australia, US, UK. Pricing is definitely much more compressed in Australia because the market is uh, more saturated. It's been going longer. Um, I'd say pricing in the UK, yeah, it's, it's, it is being compressed because there's more competition. Uh, I think that's probably a good thing for everybody here. Chris, how about you? Sure. Um, so I, I agree. You've seen a lot more money come in, a lot more players. Uh, there's also a number of uh, firms that are like unfunded sponsors. They don't have their own pool of capital, but they're going out and um, soliciting deals. I think the other factor that's driven the pricing pressure is third-party intermediaries. So as they come into the marketplace and they provide a certain um, savvy or knowledge about the space, they are representing claimants and law firms and helping them get the best deals possible. But it's really, I think, more geographically focused. So if you're doing a lot of claims in the markets that Louise mentioned, much more competitive. Um, if you're doing cases in the Middle East, Africa, South America, you're going to see very little competition. So we're still enthusiastic by the market opportunity, notwithstanding the fact that there's a lot more money coming in. Uh, yeah, in my sector, I guess, of litigation funding, um, I don't see a lot of, of yield compression, mostly because uh, a lot of the claims that are brought to us are brought to us by clients or um, investigators, forensic accountants, um, who are, are sort of the demands client-driven, whereas, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chris and Louise, but in straight commercial dispute funding, you know, a lot of a lot of people are funding law firms, and you would know this too, Bill, and it, it, it at least appears to me that lawyers are pretty sophisticated people, you know, they... Uh, um, they, yeah, I think people are, are getting better at valuing and underwriting those types of portfolios, and, and because of that, they can kind of create competition for, for people to provide them with capital. Mm. Um, I, I don't see it as much in my sector. I might add on the pricing discussion, it's maybe harder to tell between the funders how they're pricing because it's the, the structuring has been changing hugely in the last couple of years. So. Whereas originally you might have had funders asking for a return of capital plus a three times, four times multiple. Now, it seems we are asked to do a very, very bespoke pricing arrangement. You're, you might be looking at percentages, you might be looking at multiples, you might be looking at 
um, various tranches that go up or go down depending on the level of risk. You might be getting insurers involved who can then adjust uh, that particular slice of risk. So it's while the pricing is changing, it's probably the structuring that I've noticed changing the most. Yeah, and I think this is uh, great for those of you who are looking for funding because the market is becoming more competitive. Uh, I don't believe this is a liquid market yet uh, or it's commoditized yet, but uh, it certainly uh, uh, helps borrowers from, your, from my perspective. Um, Jimmy talked about sectors before. Um, you know, at Beckel Key, we don't finance uh, personal injury or mass tort. Uh, maybe each of you can talk about which area of focus uh, in terms of sectors you guys look at uh, for the audience so that if they have a case that, you know, it's fundable or not. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, yeah, my funds are, are pretty specialized. Uh, so we, we only deal with uh, collection risk. And I, I think maybe we all look at it uh, at the industry this way as three types of risk when you're funding litigation. So there's obviously um, liability, proving liability, uh, figuring out what the damages are, which is, I'm sure it goes into your underwriting, and then actually making sure that the people pay you the money once you, know, you get a positive result. So I deal only with collection risk, which is the third leg of that stool. Um, and um, well, it's, I, I don't know, it's just uh, because it's kind of, um, it, it's kind of specialized. Um, it's, it's really, um, well, it's just, it, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to explain. <laughs> It's probably better. Uh, you guys are more generalist, so it's probably, uh, it's probably better. Sure. To so uh, one of the things I think that makes Delta different is the fact that we do traditional litigation finance, but we also um, specialize in uh, recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and there, aren't, there isn't a lot of competition in that sector, as you mentioned. Uh, the competition tends to be large investigative firms, public accounting firms, liquidation and insolvency professionals who have gotten a mandate from a court or for a client to try and recover. Um, we come in and we're providing the capital that allows those firms to effectuate very efficient recovery efforts. So to be clear, I'm, I'm not sure about your model. In our model, while we are lawyers and recovery professionals, we never take that over as the practitioner. We're more like the coach on the sideline where because of our collective wisdom and experience, we're calling the play, if you will. We're helping the investigators and the lawyers figure out the best path towards recovery. Mm -hmm. And since we don't receive a dime unless there's a recovery, we're kind of the only professional that is focused on what's the best thing to do to enhance recovery. Um, there's not a lot of other firms, a lot of the other funders, for obvious reasons, have decided they provide capital on a passive basis. They don't want to um, get involved in kind of the nitty gritty of collections. Mm -hmm. Because there's less competition, it's one of the areas that we've always tried to differentiate ourselves. But there aren't a lot of us in the market but we also do traditional litigation finance. It just so happens, from a practical standpoint, once we covered, funded some litigation and we couldn't collect, mm -hmm. that we suddenly found ourselves in the business of funding, <laughs> funding recoveries. Right. Now that you've built up that expertise, because it does take a while, uh, it's something that we actually value a great deal. And, uh, there's been no, no pricing pressure whatsoever, at least in that sector, yeah, right? yeah. sector of our business. No, that's right. I should add, too, we, I mean, um, a lot of our work comes from it, it's, it could be at any stage of what you, I guess you'd call it sort of judgment and enforcement cycle. So sometimes we have clients who come to us and say, um, you know, I won an award and, and I didn't get paid. Sometimes people will say, I think somebody stole hundreds of millions of dollars from me. And sometimes they have very mature claims which, where, where clients have already um, sought out lawyers, um, forensic accountants, maybe even investigators. And the piece is, is in some ways mature, but already has a team that's assembled to be able to try to enforce the judgment. Um, but in other circumstances, people, you know, it, each claim is, is different um, depending on the circumstances. And so sometimes they look to us not only to provide capital, but also to give them suggestions on who to use as practitioners. So we get a little bit more involved in assembling sort of bespoke teams to help recover uh, value for our clients than we would if we were, um, you know, if you're funding a commercial dispute, usually the, um, the, the claims has, has merits, but it's also is as good as the law firm that's uh, that's prosecuting the claim, and so you got to rely on them a lot, and, and rightfully so. Whereas I, it's it's just a little different to be able to figure out how to recover value when you're dealing with nothing but collection risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd echo the uh, the importance of the team there. They say a good a good lawyer can win a bad case, a bad lawyer can lose you a good case. Mm -hmm. We at Benchwalk don't have much involvement once the deal is signed. We we're going to leave it to the lawyers. We're not trying to be the best lawyers in the room. Uh, we, we, 
lead the legal work to the experts. In terms of sectors that we cover, it's pretty much everything. Um, IP, mass torts, uh, arbitration, it's very wide ranging. We have a lot of capital to put to work, so we're looking for as many different opportunities as possible. You know, I can go into detail on, on how our business works maybe a bit later, but um, we're essentially looking to get a very diversified portfolio with as many cases as possible in that portfolio. So the more wide ranging uh, and far flung, the better. So, Jim, you mentioned uh, passive versus active uh, management of cases. Um, Louise, I'm not sure, uh, we don't do a lot in the UK, but in the US there, there are ethical reasons why, as a funder, we cannot be, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. involved or Jumped be, yeah, exactly. I assume you guys have that issue here? Yeah, uh, yeah because I, I would like to get some more involved in asset recovery because I believe it's a lot less binary, right, when we invest in a mm -hmm. litigation uh, because we have to be passive and we have no control, you know, it's, yeah, it's a lot less uh, comfortable than uh, asset recovery where you just have to chase down where the assets are. So uh, the next topic, uh, in terms of geographic uh, location, in terms of your cases, do you tend to focus in a certain area? Uh, well, I'd say about 50% of our cases are, are basically based in the States. Then we have UK and Australia. Um, some of our exciting new projects involve backing law firms, and one of those was in Australia. So we have good friends there already. Um, so as far as the geographic coverage, even though we're based in the States in Chicago and New York, um, we've always taken the perspective that the best cases are not in your backyard. And so I think uh, in an effort to try to build the most diverse portfolio, we have done cases in mainland China, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, North Africa, some of the jurisdictions where the other funders are like, you know, where's that place located? Um, but also obviously in the United States and London. There's just a lot more co competition for deals in New York, Chicago, Australia, as you mentioned, in London. But there's a lot of opportunities out there that don't exactly fit the geographic coverage. So in building the most diverse portfolio, it usually takes us to some unique places. Jim, how about spicy you? One, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> fun, fun places. Yeah. For, for my own part, um, we, when we look at claims, we, we have to be concerned about the, um, about the originating jurisdiction of the claims. I mean, if the, if, if they're, uh, if the judgment uh, or the sort of the, the legal process in the originating jurisdiction isn't strong or it's not recognized as a court of competent jurisdiction whenever you try to go internationally to enforce uh, judgments. And these are like, these are large, High value judgments where uh, judgment debtors are purposely trying to conceal assets or, or, or most likely moving assets to another jurisdiction to be able to avoid um, service or execution of any of, of the judgments domestically in the form where the judgment was rendered. So um, we, we make sure that the originating jurisdictions are at least reliable enough that we can use the court system there to then start transporting those judgments to other jurisdictions. Um, but then we're, uh, we always say that we're, we're lucky that, that uh, people who uh, try to avoid uh, paying judgments or people who commit fraud or people who um, you know benefited from the proceeds of corruption, they always hide their assets in. Um, it, we call it like a flight to quality, right? They, they're not going to they're not going to steal a bunch of money and, and put it in a dodgy jurisdiction where they're not uh, going you know where their money's just going to get stolen again. So luckily, you know, um, thanks to the, the British Empire, in, in fact, seventy percent of the world's economies I think practice some form of UK derivative law, and most of the jurisdictions where people hide assets have some kind of reliable banking system so that they can you know. They can put their money there and uh, and a reliable rule of law, but that also means it cuts both ways, and there are also reliable mechanisms by which you can actually lay claim to proceeds in those other jurisdictions. So, um, it, it means that we're, we uh, we work all over the world, but just by the nature of the work that we do, we uh, we usually operate in the, the typical jurisdictions where people would hide money. So, going back to <clears throat> the question of pricing, uh, on average, our deal size is about $15 million. The smallest deal we do is $5 million. So, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are in terms of pricing. Are the pricing better for sub $5 million deals and then better above certain size? Sure, I can speak on that. Um, our smaller size is probably a one million investment for a 10 million claim. That's the sort of bog standard answer that you'll get from a funder. Um, we closed one yesterday, that was a 60 million 
uh, dollar investment in one case. Before that, a $50 million for one case. Um, the trend is that we want to deploy a larger amount of co capital. Um, so it, we're, allowed, we're, we're in a place where we can look at the larger deal sizes. And obviously, when you model it all through and you look how much the claimant's going to take home, the larger the starting amount, the easier it is to be paying those very large legal fees, those very large investigation fees, those very large accountancy fees, <laughs> uh, and for everyone still to be happy at the end. Um, would we change our pricing on the, on the size of a deal? Um, we, we would have to look at it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's going to come down to the risks. But for us, we're looking for large size cases. Yeah, no, I guess my question was more assuming the mayor is about the mm -hmm. same. Can you drive pricing higher because you know there are not many players that could do the $60 million deals? Or are there cases where it's too small, nobody wants to spend, waste their time on it, so you can also drive pricing, that kind of, sure. do, you, do you notice that at all? There are here some uh, market players who will specialize in the smaller claims. Most are looking kind of in, in, in the me median size, and then there are a few who are looking at the very large size. There are not many funders who could do 60 million or 50 million in one go. Um, and that means that the people competing for that deal are limited. But essentially, you know, Benchwalk, it was founded by me, by Adrian a year ago, um, we're keen to get deals, we're keen to make relationships, so we're going to look at competitive pricing. Um, it's good for everybody to have a bit of competition. Yeah, I think there's been, um, there's more price sensitivity at the two ends of the marketplace, right? If someone's putting in 50 or $60 million, there's few funders who could do that. Um, and it's interesting, I hadn't really thought about it that way, because when we've done bigger facilities, um, we've been willing to accept a lower return simply because it's the magnitude of the numbers are much larger. Conversely, we're also one of the funders who are willing to do smaller amounts. Um, and so sub one million, I would say, it's very much a, a, a funder's marketplace where you can charge very significant returns. Also in recoveries, um, at least is the way our pricing is, is it's always a multiple of capital the way Louis described. It's historically rock plus a few times. In enforcement actions, it's never that. At least it's never that for us. It's always a percentage of the total recovery, which is another benefit of doing these types of deals, is you could make much more money than three times. And that's because the perception is you're adding value. If all you're doing is providing capital, that's worth something. If you're providing capital plus expertise, and it's really your collective wisdom, it's your network of intelligence professionals that allows you to track the assets, that is a value that claimants and lawyers very much value. And so they don't seem to shy away when present them with a proposal where you might be getting 30, 40, 50% of the total recovery. Yeah, that's right. As, I mean, for me, I, it's it's similar. As I mean, just as a sort of, I don't know, my personal morality, I don't I don't invest in claims where we would end up making more money than the claimant. I assume you guys are, you, you all are the same way. Um, it's yes. just, I, I, just I, don't, I don't want the industry or myself to have a reputation of taking advantage of people. Uh, admittedly, when it comes to judgment enforcement, sometimes, um, you know, uh, we become a lender of last resort because people don't really know what their recourse is or how to actually you know, to commit the expertise that you're talking mm -hmm. about, Chris, to be able to effect a recovery. So if they don't get funding, either because they maybe they have litigation fatigue, they've already spent too much money getting a judgment, and they realize that they have to spend more money and they don't want to to enforce it, or they don't know how to, or you know, in the case of large insolvencies, they, um, they, they realize that the, they don't have operating capital even to run the, the bankruptcies, much less to go look for assets um, in other jurisdictions. Um, we have sovereign clients who have plenty of capital, but they actually don't, um, um, sometimes it's hard for them to actually get budget from their, uh, uh, from their own operations, and, to, and they, they like to be able to short circuit the bureaucracy involved in trying to enforce these things themselves. But sometimes the people who stole the money are actually still in the minority par uh, party in parliament, so they can't, they can't uh, pass a bill that says they wanna um, allocate some money to go after stolen assets, so we, we kind of serve a role there, but, um, for the most part, our pricing is um, is uh, usually a f is fixed on a, f a factor of what the we think that we call the putative debts of a judgment um, are, or, or how much money was stolen, really. So we can't look at a claim that's less than, let's say, $20 million in putative debts, uh, because uh, it costs the same amount of money, as we say, to, do, to try to enforce um, in, a, you know, in an offshore jurisdiction if you're trying to freeze a million dollars, as it does if you're trying to freeze $100 million. So it's going to cost... Um, the work usually costs anywhere from one to maybe, I think our, the, 
largest claims are maybe 10 million, um, depending on how complex they are. Um, and so we just we just have to figure out what the inputs are and the outputs are, and then we price it accordingly to make sure that we don't make more money than our, our clients. So each one's um, each one's different. Well, sometimes we well one thing we insist on is 100% downside protection. So we always get our first dollar back. I think we can probably all agree with that. Uh, and then, like you said, a percentage of anything that we recover on top of that, or a multiple, or sometimes a mix of the two, just to to be able to get it right, so that at the end of the day, the client's happy, we're happy. The, you know, the practitioners who are doing the work don't take advantage of us, <laughs> and, you know, and it's a good result for everybody except for the bad guy. I think that's yeah, the only other thing I would add that I think is important is it um, depends on which side you're working for. So mm -hmm. you do a lot of cases for the sovereigns. Sovereigns are more price sensitive, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Um, they have difficulty in thinking that you, they, or they oversimplify how easy it is they think it is to recover something. Yeah, and true. so when you ask them for a 20 or 30 percent fee, they look at their head and be like, no, this is easy to collect. This is a 4 or 5 percent deal. <laughs> and you point out to them all of the complexities of doing it because if you're not used to doing it um, or if you're from the States and you're used to bill collectors and you think we're like bill collectors, yeah. that misses the boat entirely. You're talking, as Jim said, very complicated multi-jurisdictional cases um, by persons who are well-funded, who are very experienced in hiding assets. So this isn't simply I'm making a phone call to them and they're going to pay you the debt. This is much more about trying to find the asset. The asset oftentimes changes form. It'll go from a liquid form to an illiquid form or vice versa. So these are very complicated cases. But if you're on representing the sovereign or funding the sovereign, they're more price sensitive. It may be that it's a 5% or a 10% uh, you know, fee of something that's liquid like a bank account. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you're on, on the side that we're often on, which is opposite the sovereign, they're less price sensitive because they realize that, but for us, they're never going to be able to recover something. And so without gouging, and I agree with you, you never want more than 50% clearly, um, there's just less price sensitivity. So it's been a lucrative part of our business to focus on that. So Luis, uh, you mentioned doing a $60 million deal. Uh, I, I come from the uh, banking world. We, we always think about syndicating deals or, or we think about concentration and, and risk limit. Uh, we haven't done a deal that big just because we're only managing 400 million, so 60 million in any one case, even if it's a portfolio, is quite large. Uh, do you guys ever think about uh, doing club deals with uh, other funders? Absolutely, we do. I did um, give you my card, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, we often take inquiries from other funders or even private equity. There are lots of people who are interested in helping us deploy our capital, funnily enough. Um, a kind of uh, side issue on the pricing might be just an observation that I've found that um, w our priority is not particularly the pricing. Our priority is actually building this portfolio that I alluded to earlier. So getting, getting your head around this idea that let's say I'm going uh, to give Joe $100 million, he's going to invest in 20 cases. He <coughs> is going to do better than Alex at the back, who is going to invest that 100 million in 10 cases. And Alex is going to do better than Carmel, who's going to invest in five cases. So taking that fairly simple principle and expanding it, our absolute priority has to be to get as many cases as possible into our portfolio. And how do we do that? Well, we turn things around very quickly, three weeks, roughly. Um, and how do we do that? We get the lawyers to take a whole load of risk. Um, we can't be the lawyer sitting there reviewing the case for six months. Um, so this is, we would like to say, a slightly different business model to some others, but uh, it's essentially an asset class. Litigation is just any asset class. It's asset A, price B, yield curve C. Um, so my, my years of litigation experience I've discovered are actually less relevant than the ability to manage a portfolio. <laughs> Talking about uh, underwriting, uh, do you guys have an in-house underwriting team or do you outsource that or do you rely on having the lawyer have skin in the game as you mentioned? Uh, we do use insurers. Uh, insurers are becoming an increasingly important part of our business. We've recently recruited someone from the insurance industry who's been helping us change the landscape here in London at least. Um, insurers have traditionally been able to provide ATE uh, for the adverse cost risk, but now they're sort of branching into other areas where they can 
take a slice of the risk. They might insure our principal or part of our principal. They might bring several insurers together to uh, slice up the different vertical levels of risk and um, allocate those to different people. Um, I mean, it can be it can be sliced and diced in many different ways, um, and structuring is a really fascinating part of it. And again, that's something we hope we can bring to the table. There we go. I got one of the uh, got one of the catchphrases in. How about you guys from an uh, underwriting perspective? Yeah, um, I just want to mention about the syndication increase. Um, coming out of private equity world, we're used to club deals, right? And one of the things we found peculiar about this industry is the fact that there isn't a lot of cooperation. Notwithstanding the fact that we know your firm and you know your firm, et cetera, it seems that at least in the, the, the past history, everyone's been trying to carve out market share. Everyone's been trying to tap into proprietary deal flow. We've been an advocate, I think, from the beginning of trying to do club deals, syndicate, maybe pooling risk together as opposed to giving more money to the insurance industry and, and us profiting from that. I think all those things are coming down the road. Um, there's been some secondary transactions now in the marketplace. Uh, our firm has done one recently. I think that shows there's a little bit more liquidity in the marketplace than what we were used to. That then invites in more institutional investors coming in who have this desire for diversified risk. So mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that you're, you're building the portfolio that you are in the way that you are. Um, as far as underwriting, our process is a hybrid. So there are firms, as Bill points out, that do all the work internally. Um, that's high overhead. Um, and unless you've got a very talented team, I'm not sure how you could do all of that. Then there's firms that outsource everything. And you can run very leanly. That's one of the great things about this business is you don't need to have 35 people to manage three, four, five hundred million dollars. Um, we've determined that the best approach is a hybrid. So it always starts with the claimants lawyers first, right, preparing the memo. That's going to be biased no matter how good they are. Um, and so you're now going to have to do some internal work. So we've got a core team that can diligence cases that we do a lot of mining, international arbitration, construction, investment cases. If it was an IP case, that's not a case we're going to diligence internally. You're going to have to send that outside right away. So. As you know, there's fir certain firms now that have specialized in IP or certain areas. They have the internal capability of doing it. We found the best approach is a hybrid. We do a lot of the work internally. We always get an outside opinion. If nothing else, it gives us comfort that we haven't fallen in love with our own deal, uh, which is something I think everyone has a tendency to do. Yeah, so to answer the first part of the question, as far as, uh, it's funny, there's the, um, there's the portfolio manager part of me that likes to diversify all my risks and have uh, you know uh, diversification in a lot of ways. In, in geographic risk as far as our spend. Um, but then there's the trading part of me that says that if there's a claim that's really good, I want to put as much money to work as possible in it. So I, I kind of uh, try to balance those two whenever, whenever we're making investments to make sure that we don't have too, too much concentration risk. But you know, in some ways, some of these, uh, some of these asymmetric uh, you know, opportunities, um, you, you want to plow a, a lot of money in if you think you're going to get a multiple on it. Because uh, it, in some ways, it can behave like venture capital, where a couple of big deals can pay for the whole portfolio. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a danger to that, but um, we, we rely on our underwriting skills to be able to figure out if a claim is going to be going to be good. And, uh, and along the way, at least in, in asset recovery and judgment enforcement, um, sometimes we want to spend as little money as possible until we want to spend as much money as possible because we realize that it's going to it's the claim's going to make good. Um, as far as our, our, our own underwriting processes, we actually do a lot of our diligence um, in house. Um, but admittedly, I mean, um, I think just like all of you uh, over time, we've gotten very good at saying no quickly to claims, and we've gotten better at underwriting just on some of the um, sort of the obvious merits of a claim, like how large it is, the jurisdictions in which the, you know, we might have to operate, um, how old the claim is. Um, so we can, we can say no pretty quickly. But we've also, over time, developed a lot of relationships with a lot of people who are very good, um, at least in, in my specific field. And they almost do underwriting for us, really. They, 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 they don't want to burn bridges with a, a, a provider of capital who they can trust. So they, they do a lot of uh, their own sort of vetting of claims before they bring them to us, and that helps a lot. And so some people I'm just um, comfortable enough working with that we still do the diligence, but we know it's a good claim before it comes in the house. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an important point. Mm -hmm. um, over time, what I've seen in the industry that's changed a lot is education of the marketplace, education of your channel. So at the beginning when we started, 90% of the cases that came to us, you'd never fund, right? And we talked about this earlier um, offline about 
third party intermediaries bringing us cases and us trying to determine whether that case has been around the block and none of us are going to touch it. For the most part, it's interesting because we'll go to a conference like this and we'll, we just did this, we were all looking at the, basically the same case. Um, so there's definitely a need for more intermediaries to help in this regard. But I think it's also educating the channel so that now 90% of the cases that come to us meet our investment criteria. And it's about figuring out what's the best to fit in your particular portfolio. And when you're saying no, because it is so easy to say no, I think all of us, it does a, a service to the industry to say no, but here's why. Because there's cases that yeah, you right. would not have funded um, because some things weren't there. But if you took the time to tell them if this and this and this were addressed, then we would fund it. That helps the industry. It makes it look like we're all not sitting there just saying no to everything that comes across our desk. Mm -hmm. Because I think the perception is a lot of people think the funders are just sitting there saying no to everything. And it's not, so when you know, your firm Louise, wants to put a lot of money to work, that helps all of us. Because I think there is a perception or a misperception that we only cherry pick the very best cases and everything else doesn't get funded. It's, it's not the case, especially in an enforcement action. Mm -hmm. You may actually say, I'll work with you because if you did these things, then I will be willing to fund. That's right. a big deal. Yeah. Um, that separates you from the people who are just constantly saying no, no, no. Yeah, you want to be constructive. That's that's absolutely right. And then you know, it, it, litigation uh, in all types is a it's a temporal process, right? And things can evolve in you know in good ways or in bad ways. Some of them are unforeseen, but you can if you give people feedback and you say, um, you know, if these things happen, maybe I'd be more interested in it, and you know, and you're sincere about it, then um, sometimes those things, those positive developments occur while they're still funding it on their own, and then they come back to you. Maybe that right. means it's going to be you know a better deal for them. But you know, these things develop in ways that are positive, and it makes it. Uh, gives you an ability to fund things instead of just saying no, you know, all the time. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. I should I'd also add, it's funny because we were joking about um, uh, this before. We, one thing that I think a lot of people don't know, too, if, 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 if someone was bringing a claim to a litigation funder, um, depending on how aggressive they are in trying to get terms from different people, we all talk to each other all the time. So it, it's, it's surprisingly still a, a, a fairly small community. And... Um, I don't know if, if people who present claims to litigation funders know this, but if they if they speak to multiple parties, it, there's a chance that the, that the parties have all talked to each other, um, and sometimes either because they want to syndicate it or just they we just talk because we it, it's still kind of a collaborative um, industry. I always have people ask me like, what are your underwriting criteria? You know, and I, I'm happy to be forthcoming about it because we're just trying to get positive results for the people who we invest with. Yeah, it's funny you mention that um, because I was just thinking the same thing. We'll oftentimes hear a lawyer tell us, well, we've got a term sheet, um, so you really need to get us another term sheet you know, by this deadline. And we'll just say, well, quite honestly, I can't meet that. If, if you've already got a term sheet, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to get you a new term sheet in the next seven days. Then when they hem and haw and come back to you, you realize they didn't really have, have an offer, right? right? Yeah. They're just trying to bait you, and it's true. While we're not as collegial as we should be in sharing financial risk, and I hope that changes, I think we are very familiar with each other where if someone's presenting us a, a claim and it sounds too good to be true, might call up another funder and they say, yeah, I've seen it. It wasn't called that when I saw it. It was called, you know, <laughs> Project Brown and now it's Project Red. Well, it looks the same color to me. It's, it's the same deal. So I think we appreciate people who are transparent. We know that we have competition. None of us are looking to, you know, grab market share in an unfair way. I think we have no issue with saying these are our investment criteria. I think what people don't understand is we're all trying to manage a portfolio. So it may be a great case for Louise because it fits her portfolio, but I have too much concentration risk. Yeah. Or I've already got enough exposure to South America. Doesn't mean I don't love that case. Mm -hmm. Call Bill and say, Bill, take a look at this case. So I think the more people are honest and transparent with us, the more likely it is we're going to be honest and transparent with you and giving you feedback. Yeah, we'll call that amateur hour, right? You know, <laughs> oh, we got a term sheet already. Give us a... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got one, I just need another one. Yeah, yeah there's another aspect too where I, it's, we have our own uh, sort of uh, fundraising and capital deployment um, you know, issues it, it, uh, in our funds. So depending on where we are in certain life cycles, um, sometimes you know, I think we, we, know, we have some, some colleagues of ours who we know like always want to deploy right before the end of the year. You know, and then once they've, once they've mm -hmm. taken enough, down enough claims, then you know, in the first three months of the, of the year, they're not looking at anything and it's just, it's just the way that they behave. It's a kind of idiosyncratic, but we, we all have these, uh, you know, these, our own internal requirements for managing capital. Um, they don't always necessarily, if, it, if it's a good deal, we always find a way to, to, to do it, no matter, at least in, in my circumstances. But sometimes it's just not the right time, and it's, it, exactly. we're willing to pass it off to other people if it's a meritorious claim. Yeah. 
Yeah, one last question uh, before we open the, uh, the floor to Q&A. You mentioned uh, insurance, Louise. Uh, it's quite surprising to me uh, how evolved the industry has become because if you ask me uh, six years ago or eight years ago, you know, it, if a funder wants to insure a case or a portfolio of cases, no one would insure that because like, we're supposed to be the expert, right? Why do you want to get out, right? Is that too good to be true, adverse selection issue? H how does that evolve? Uh, I haven't done much insurance, so I'd love to sure. hear. Well, it's really a very recent change, I would say. Um, the insurers were always interested in selling ATE insurance. It's one of the most expensive insurers you can buy, so it's profitable for them. Um, there are certain players who've got litigation experience and exposure and they've been um, profiting from that and um, we essentially have been telling them this is the product we need and this is how it needs to be written and this is how it needs to be underwritten and you might want to reinsure here but for this to work you need to move faster um, what do you need to see what is you, what what are their criteria can we can we help move this process along because the big complaint from clients to date has been that the insurance part of it has slowed everything down um, almost to a standstill um, so we're doing our best to uh, to disrupt the industry and speed things up are, are you concerned at all that the in insurance industry will ultimately take over the market if they are moving to this asset class, if they're underwriting and insuring you, they might as well earn the larger upside and just do it themselves, right? Well, if the insurance industry becomes more sophisticated, then brilliant. If the legal system becomes more sophisticated, then brilliant. It means the end of funders, and that means I'll become a banker. <laughs> uh, How about you guys? Do you guys yeah, do yeah, much insurance? Question, Louise, on the insurance, because, again, when we first started, insurance was incredibly difficult to get. I remember coming here and meeting with a representative from Lloyd's, and it was like pulling teeth. Um, and I have seen a change in the last kind of 18 or 24 months. I think the challenge is, um, are they doing it on a prospective basis, or are they doing it on a fixed portfolio? So we have found that if you've already got an existing portfolio, mm -hmm. and it's well seasoned and it's great cases, then they're much easier to wrap their hands around the risk and price it. That's a great product. What's a product that would help our industry grow tremendously, however, is if you got it on a prospective basis, almost like profit insurance, um, which means they're basically betting on your team that you're going to be able to deal into things accordingly and that you're going to have a diverse portfolio. And some have started to talk about that, but I don't think the industry's there yet. But mm. that's why I'm curious if you've seen it on a prospective basis. The yes, the uh, last two weeks, I would say. We've it been, is a recent development. Yeah, very but. recent. <laughs> we've been pushing that idea. Um, and it's taken a lot of time and effort, yeah. but um, we are opening insurers' eyes to possibilities and they're taking a greater interest. I think it's what you said, the ATE premiums are so large that it's so lucrative for them. If they could just wrap their hands around it, and if they're insuring you know, art and other esoteric asset classes where there's idiosyncratic risk, there's no reason why they can't do it for our industry. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about it, Bill, but yeah, you're exactly right. We could be disintermediated by the insurance companies, the same way we could be by large funds. Yeah. Um, so it's a challenging time in the industry because we're growing and there's a huge potential. But as it becomes uh, an industry above the radar, so to speak, now everyone is flocking to it, right? Everyone wants their piece of the pie. I hadn't thought about the insurance industry. They're slow to move, but when they move, they move like dinosaurs. They have tons of money. They have Big underwriting too, expertise, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny to say that, so, I mean, Admittedly, like I chase after some pretty dicey people, so the only insurance I'm thinking about is my Q-Man insurance, unfortunately, right. or my K&R insurance. <laughs> but uh, is I've, I've run into scenarios now, one of the things, it's not so much insurance as much as there's secondary liquidity, where uh, mainstream PE firms are coming into the market uh, place, and they have their own portfolio allocations, and they say, I want this risk because it doesn't correlate with other things in my portfolio. Right. And they'll buy out, I mean, I, I, I had offers to buy out portfolios of mine once they were mature because people can get their their arms around them, um, and the pricing was pretty attractive, just because they want to take, they want to take risk. And then even then, I said, well, you know, you're you're buying me out at a pretty steep premium, and then you think that you would, you know, there must be more upside for you. How, what are you going to do? And they said, well, I think if the portfolio matures even more, we'll sell it onto an insurance company. So it's like even you know people with massive pools of capital who want diversification are even going to. Um, there might be a, a, a tertiary market for 
for these kinds of claims. I like to keep things in-house because I believe in, you know, in, in actually um, proving results, you know, and having uh, positive outcomes, but that's something that's coming for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, we can go all day. So we, no, why don't we uh, leave some, a few minutes for questions by the audience? Um, thank you very much for championing litigation funding as an access to justice and um, we, um, we love our ability to assist in access to justice. I would say we're probably slightly passive in waiting for the, for the right laws to be passed. Um, I suppose if we had a huge team and we had a section that could do lobbying, maybe we would spend some time doing that, but at the moment were focusing on getting the best results. Um, I hope that there are others out there do, doing that lobbying on my behalf. So uh, we had experience with your firm in particular in Ireland. Um, so it's interesting to see that uh, that's the example you raised. I, I think Luz is right. There's not a lot that we have done as an as a industry. Mm -hmm. And I think we all would welcome some industry association, whether it's a lobbying, because now there's groups, especially in the United States, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, who come out and say, you know, we're evil, as opposed to providing access to justice. And I think all of us feel that what we do is a benefit to society, that we're not some kinds of parasites living off of the, the ill will of, of right. other people or misfortune. Um, but I don't know that there's a lot that we can do. I think we do rely on lawyers, lobbying firms, government relations firms, public accounting firms to do that. But some kind of collaborative effort would make sense. Ireland is particularly important just because the number of claims that are potentially there for funders to get involved in are huge. I think initially we thought maybe if we back some of these claims early on, a solution would come. They'd have to do it. That really didn't turn out to be the case. We know in speaking with Harbor and some of the others on the cases that we were looking at, it's slow in coming. Um, and I'm not sure what we could do other than some kind of advocacy group or lobbying group to try to make that happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, just to, to give it context, the reason why the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, tries to, hates litigation funding, obviously, is because they represent massive businesses who don't like to be sued by people. And, and litigation funding, in a lot of ways, levels the, the playing field for smaller um, plaintiffs because litigation is expensive. Um, but in the insolvency context, I haven't really run into um, into many champerty maintenance issues. Um, mostly. There's, there's developed markets in, in a lot of jurisprudence around the world to, um, for people to be able to actually trade uh, judgments and debts. And so if you're talking about enforcement um, post-liquidation, there, um, there, there isn't as much of a sort of a, a jaundiced view towards um, funding in, in that context. And, um, but maybe as sort of belt and braces, a lot of times if we fund an estate, um, we're fairly transparent with the liquidators. And a lot of times they even, um, with, you know, without, without us being well known enough that the, that potential defendants can try to exacerbate recovery efforts by, by suing us for trying to fund them and, and arguing champion maintenance. A lot of times we'll insist that liquidators that get, the, um, get the, the borrowings that they would have from us to be able to run their estates um, approved by the courts. And we like that for, for two reasons. First of all, it gives us some more protection and more legitimacy, but also it kind of perfects our, um, our priority in the recoveries because each, it seems like insolvencies in each jurisdiction, they have their own bankruptcy laws. And um, you have to make sure that, that your funding is at a certain place in the waterfall so that you're getting paid back for, for helping recover assets for these liquidators instead of secured creditors or unsecured creditors because a lot of times just managing these estates is a big mess. Um, but luckily, I think post-judgment, they're a lot more accepting than, um, than in a commercial dispute environment where you know it's just two people kind of uh, duking it out in court. Yeah, and it li the, the, the liquidation space is important for incremental change for that very reason. We funded several um, cases in liquidation, and in each case, they had to go and get approval from the court. 
Mm -hmm. So they're actually reviewing things and being more proactive than if you didn't have that extra judicial step. So you probably will see more changes coming about from the liquidation space for that very reason. Right. Well, and actually, I'll, I should also mention that we, we like to have the, our, our terms approved by the courts because we don't want to um, be seen as taking advantage of creditors. You know, I mean, in some of these ins like big insolvencies like Ponzi schemes and things, we've, we've seen, you name it, you know, suicides, heart attacks. Like these people are usually, their lives can be, can be ruined by, by some bad actors. And we don't want um, the perception that we're doing anything other than trying to help them recover as much money for themselves as they possibly can. So we like to be as transparent as we can when it comes to that. Yeah, I think there's a big confusion in the marketplace. Uh, you know, the whole term patent trolls, uh, mm -hmm. also lending to uh, individual consumers who has a claim at, you know, 50% interest rate. I, I think people get confused with, I think what we do, which is more I call it financing uh, commercial right. legitimate claims, right? So, uh, any other questions? Well, I guess we'll we'll, we'll break for lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have to definitely uh, start more.